I'm Dr. Gail Gross. I'm very happy to have as my guest today, Deborah Sege. Among her many accomplishments, Deborah is known worldwide as the founding godmother of the mind-body fitness movement. She established two of the most successful health spas in the world, Rancho La Puerta and The Golden Door. Deborah has devoted her time and talent to public service. From 1984 to 1990, she served as president of the Inter-American Foundation, an independent agency of the United States government supporting the self-help efforts of the poor throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. In keeping with her heritage as the daughter of immigrant parents, her current project is the Immigration Museum of New Americans. She is the founder and chair of that institution as well. It is a museum devoted to connecting immigrants with the United States while honoring the journeys and culture of their countries of origin. Deborah Sege, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure having you today. Your life has been amazing. Tell us how this all began for you, how you ended up in Tahiti, for heaven's sake. Well, I don't really know how it all began. <laughs> <laughs> I had an unusual mom, and so often that's the case. But uh, we were living in Brooklyn, and um, there was a depression. And we were, at that time, fruitarians, and the only available fruit was bananas. And moms got bored with that. My dad had lost his money in the stock market crash. And one day she came home and she said, Honey, we're leaving. And Dad said, Where to? And she said, Tahiti. And my dad said, Where's that? <laughs> and she said, I don't really know, but here are the tickets. And oh. she went out and my brother and I, my mom and my dad, spent over five years in Tahiti in the late 30s. What a risk taker. There wasn't much going around in Brooklyn at yes. that time. And... and Mom was always searching for paradise. Yes, and she was an immigrant to this yes, country. Both, both my parents. Of your parents were. Yeah. Where were they from? Um, we're Jewish, and my mother came from Austria, and my dad came from Poland, Russia. Yes, and so you go to Tahiti. That I mean, was wonderful. Explorers, I can see that ship, you know, <laughs> crossing the ocean. This great it was adventure. A long, it was a, a long from, journey. From Brooklyn to Tahiti it takes a month because you have to go through the Panama Canal. Oh and, my! But it was an adventure. Yes. And I think I always see life as an adventure. I mean, I never expect the day, each day, to be like the day before. I always, uh, there's a little challenge, a little excitement, something different. Yes. And I think it started then. There. And what is a fruitarian? At that time, we only ate fruit and everything raw. We even ate potatoes raw. Oh, I met my. some cousins of mine just re a few years ago from the old days, who I didn't even remember. And they remembered having dinner at my house and having just raw corn. <laughs> and Irving said, uh, well, when are we going to eat? And his dad kicked him under the table to say, that was it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> this is it. How did your mother get this idea? She had been a nurse when ah. people in those days came to the hospital to die. And so she didn't think that was a good idea. And she started reading books. And your mother was quite a leader. She was really ahead of her time. Oh, yeah. She was vice president of the New York Vegetarian Society in 1926. And so now you're in Tahiti, and you meet this incredible person who it ultimately... was a friend of my parents, was actually. a friend of your parents, a professor. And he was there conducting uh, health camps and writing books. My parents thought he was wonderful. Brilliant, ahead of his time. <laughs> he really was. Yes. And Mom said, when you come to the, when we were ready to leave, when you come to the States, please visit us. I was 16. We went to visit him in Mexico, and then we were going back, and I was going to college. And um, his secretary had just had his father leave, die, and his secretary was packing to leave. And so the idea was my mom and I would wait t two weeks until his new secretary arrived. He was the absent-minded, on purpose professor. Yeah. On purpose, on purpose <laughs> yeah. professor. He liked being helpless. Anyhow. And it, taken care of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it was decided that I would stay. Mom wasn't anxious. I start college right away. I was just 16. And that I would stay and help my husband as secretary. Yes. 
And that Christmas, the following Christmas, on the train going back to San Francisco and my going to college, uh, I became indispensable. And he proposed, and I thought it was wonderful, and we got married. That was it. And then, But I, it was never all planned or thought out. Your whole life is yeah. synchronistic. I'm always changing. I try every decade to have a new life, and I find that I keeps love me on that. my toes. That's wonderful. That should be a motto. Every decade, a new life. You know, Thomas Jefferson felt we should have a new constitution every 17 years. We could use one. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here you are, newly married, really so young, and your husband, Edmund, who everyone calls the professor, also an immigrant, mm -hmm. by the way, and um, a real prescriber to the concept or the philosophy of the Essenes. It's from the Bible. From the Bible. Because uh, they were one of the basic sects, and... Um, a lot of literature exists that yes. uh, Jesus and John the Baptist what were, were, Essenes. were Essenes. That's right. And so, in any case, uh, the war in Europe started for us in 1940. And uh, my husband was ordered to report to his regiment in Romania. It was Hungarian Transylvania. That didn't make a great deal of sense for a young Jewish man <laughs> to suddenly go back there. So he ignored it, so his passport was canceled, and U.S. immigration said if we were found in this country June 1st, 1940, he would be deported oh. back to his country yes. as a deserter. Oh. So we went to Mexico. And then you f were taken to your house. We rented a little place for $10 a month. That's all we could afford. Uh, he had several books published in Europe, but yes. he, they couldn't send us any money. Yes. You know, Europe was at war. war. And so we rented this little place temporarily. And temporarily, it's going to be 65 years <laughs> of temporarily. And then that I don't change every decade. And just to, in a certain way, demonstrate what you faced in the beginning, what a pioneer you were. We, were, we had no money. Yes. And we started a health camp, 1750 a week, bring your own tent. And you're we provided food, exercise. My husband lectured. The guests climbed the mountain, the same yes. mountain that you've been on. Yes. We had no idea. I mean, we weren't were creating young. anything. Yes. We weren't doing anything except existing. Existing and living your own philosophy, yeah. really. And then... Uh, Five years later, when the war ended, and we could have gone back to England, my husband was director of the British International Health and Education Center. We would laid roots, yes. and that's there you the way were. it was. But I want to draw this picture of the, the young bride coming with her husband, this professor, a bit older, and now you drive up, and he shows you your first home, and it's a hut with a tin roof, with rocks holding the roof down, no windows, no door. It was a little bit of a shock, but it was, all, but it was an adventure. Yes, and I love the, how you made use of everything. You planted your garden, everything was holistic and healthy, you used the goat's milk to make cheese. Well, we had no money. No money. <laughs> so, <laughs> Lived off the grow. land. Yeah, obviously. Yes. But I mean, it was all, I always have a feeling that my life was meant to be. Yes. I mean, I haven't, re so much of it just sort of flowed. It's going with the energy, going yes. with the flow. It wasn't a lot of methodical thinking. And both the ranch and the Golden Door have been enormously successful, but it was never planned or thought out. The ranch and the Golden Door are enormously successful. I mean, they They're are the, best. the two <laughs> pinnacles, really, yeah. the two pinnacles in yeah. um, spas in the world. I'm not just saying this. You have really changed my life because I always had a, a weight problem, always. You made me aware of how to eat and not deny myself, just be moderate. And something finally clicked with that approach because I didn't feel deprived. But we don't like the word diet. The word diet has the word die in it, yes. if you think about it. And it's something you do all every day, like breathing or yes. brushing your teeth. It's part of life, so you have to get comfortable with it. Yes. And once everyone realizes that in all probability, most of the people listening to us are going to live into their 80s. Yes, at least. Some into their 90s. 120. 
And uh, remember that line of George Burns saying, uh, who was a hundred and I knew I was going to live so long, I'd take better care of my <laughs> exactly. body. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, it is so key. You know, they, they just, there was just a wonderful article on aging in The Economist, I believe. And that's what it said, that there's really no time clock. There's no button that says over. You really could live to be 120 if you just had the right philosophy of life, did the healthy things. Well, I'm 82, so I'm practicing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, well, you know, the Eastern religions practice 60 as <laughs> midlife, so you're yeah, really in the middle. Well, they really are. They divide life into th three thirds. And the first third is growing up and getting an education. Second third is marriage, Family. children, money. And the third third is when you're at your pinnacle. Spiritual, also. Yeah. And spiritual, that is maybe. when you have your acts together. Yes. And you can do anything you want. Yes. And you have the maturity and the experience exactly. to know what you want. And so if people today would just say, I know I'm going to live into my 80s, they're automatically going to eat the right stuff. They're yes. not going to pay attention to all this junk. Yes. And your life, you have really lived your philosophy with such integrity. You really have gone with the flow of it. Here you create these incredible spas. And then in this midlife, I think about 59, you read the book Synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And I think that was Jaworski's book, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after that, you go to Congress. And I found out I would never want Congress. to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who runs for Congress, in my mind, is a hero or a heroine. Yeah. It's Def but definitely, I definitely. found out what Congress needed was a management manual. So we need to say that you lost, but yeah. you won. Oh, I won. And helped I, I, everyone. I, listen, I was so happy I lost <laughs> in, in, in retrospect. Yes. But uh, in the process, I wanted to find out what a congressperson does. You know, what do they do? All day? We know they raise money. We know they <laughs> attend meetings. But what do they do all day? Yes. And there was nothing. I met with the Republicans. I met with the Democrats. And they had no manual. And at the Golden Door on the Ranch, I've written dozens of manuals. Yes. I mean, that's how you become very good at your job, is that all your staff are reading from the same piece of music. I told my kids I wasn't going to run again, and they said, ah, wonderful. And every, well, my friends were relieved because everyone had been involved. I was going to take a check of $100,000 from our small foundation, and I was going to find a university who would take my money and lend me a political science department. Imagine. And American University took my check and gave me all the support. And we, a lot of professors and a lot of graduate students, created Setting Course, which yes. is about to have its ninth edition. Can it's still the manual for Congress and for the imagine? senators. Look how you've affected so many things, the political system, the health care system, life. The wonderful thing about the door and about Rancho La Puerta is that you also have a life philosophy that you merge, not just diet, not just exercise, but contemplation, meditation. And I love the idea that you educate your guests. Well, otherwise it's a waste of time, yes. their time. Yes. Uh, we say, you know, both the ranch and the door, you have to stay a week. And everybody arrives on the same day and leaves on the same day because there's a routine. Yes. There's a ritual. And you can't have a miracle in less than a week. Yes. It takes time, an investment in time, to be able to go through all the layers of self to start and find the genuine self. To tell how subtle your sensitivities are and how well planned these places are, I'll tell you how they affected me, but when I went to the door the first time, I'd been working very hard, and I was so tired. And you have it established in a, a traditional Japanese model and create the sacred space. And walking in, you have this golden door. And then you cross the bridge, and the bridge brings you into another consciousness. And all those symbols affect the psyche. Do you know I was so tired that first journey, Deborah, that I walked through the door twice? <laughs> I said, can I do well, this Well, you're supposed to time? leave everything behind. <laughs> exactly. So only the self goes through the door. It's so wonderful because in both places, your soul is nourished, your body is nourished, and your mind is nourished. It helps. It helps. It really helps. And it's fun because 
my staff and I are energized by happy guests like you. And I know that your calendar is as filled today as it was all of those years ago when you first begun. Actually, it's began. busier. I busier. used to have more time to read and, uh, you know, and go to movies and stuff. But now I'm so busy. I don't have time for that. There's so much to be done and so much opportunity. Yes. We have opportunity and the need to make changes in our world. You know, if you change a person, it changes lots the of world. People. And then you're changing lots of people. And the other thing is you write quite a bit. You really express yourself. I've had a lot of practice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Many manuals. I've been doing this 65 <laughs> years. Imagine. <laughs> so, I mean, no one would I've believe it, though. I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> no one would believe it. And, uh, and actually, because I was a bookworm in those early years, yes. you like to turn a phrase. Mm -hmm. When you read the book Synchronicity, you followed your intuition and let it lead you to another life. And in fact, you lived then in Washington for, for a number. 17 years. 17 years. And then came back. May I say that when you came back, you noticed that other people got old that you had known <laughs> without you? I love that line. Well, the 17 years in Washington was wonderful. I was a U.S. diplomat, and I, I literally traveled and worked in every country of Latin America except Cuba. And I averaged three weeks in every country. And there, every place is people, yes. and people in need, and being able to help people is a gift from God. Yes, and that we're all connected, and no matter where you go, don't you find that basically we all want the same thing, no oh, matter yeah. what people our culture, people. people are people, mm -hmm. and all need the same things. But I want to ask you, what did you get from that book, Synchronicity, that moved you so? It's been years since I read it. It was just, it uh, actually was reinforcing my beliefs, and was it, it just increased my comfort level. It made me feel a little less crazy, a little less dairy. <laughs> I'm sure you had to face a lot, for a woman, for heaven's sake, uh, to not only create, but become the head of these, really, these institutions. I was lucky. I really was. I was the first woman on a number of boards, first woman on the Boy Scout board, and stuff like that. Yes. And honored by a lot of people. First woman to run a major stadium. I was gotcha. chairman of the Board of Governors of our San Diego Chargers Stadium. I had a lot of help. I really, I, I think it was, my timing was good. Yes. I had a lot of support. Yes. Just lots of friends. Yes. I, I really did have, it did flow. It, did, it was easy. It wasn't, yes. it just took a lot of time. There's a spiritual law that when you're in the right flow. Yeah, exactly. That it, in a certain way, you don't have to use energy to make things happen because the correct things do happen. And we call this synchronicity. Yeah, I agree. That's interesting. <laughs> That's well put. So then you had this long marriage, which sadly ended in divorce, but you never felt divorced. No, well, I had my kids, and I had the ranch, and I had the door, and I didn't have time <laughs> for anything. But uh, if the timing of that was good, too, because yes. that freed me. I would not have gone to Washington otherwise. I would not have done these other things. Yes. I would have stayed on the ranch, and I think I would have been very narrow, you yes. know, in one channel. And that freed me to go out and... You know, explore. <laughs> yeah, try. Step. I have a teacher who used to say, "Step into the wave and let life do you." That's nice. Where you're going is really already in a certain way prescribed if you just trust that, take a risk. So, where did you get the idea to do the Golden Door? I mean, here you had Rancho La Puerta, and it was so successful. Well, it came from my guests. We had. In those days, uh, Hollywood actresses were sort of owned by their studios. Yes. And their managers were like the go-between. And when you hadn't done a film in a year or two, you, the good life, you were comfortable. Yes. And you were 25 and you wanted to look 17 or 18. And so they came to the ranch. Yes. And they said, Deborah, we want a place just Closer, for us. Yeah. And so I went to Hollywood and talked to some of the studio heads and some of the managers and said I was thinking of doing that. We opened the Golden Door with 12 guests. Oh, for heaven's in sake. A, in, a, in a motel that I bought. And I wasn't thinking that this is going to be world shaking and it's going to go, you know, <laughs> become all famous and yes. known throughout the world. Yes. It was something that our guests wanted. They just wanted to be on their own. They, you know, some of them had one particular had a slightly large bottom, and she said, "You know, 
it's so hard exercising when everybody's looking at my bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling well. <laughs> That's so amazing. Twelve people. But that's how the Golden Door started, Began. without any... Fanfare. No, no, but, and no real plans. Yeah. I really encourage people to go with that inner music, that inner voice. Yeah. You know, there, there's a Jungian se sentence, only the outcast can lead. In a certain way, you're always ahead of and the And an herd. outcast, too. And an outcast. <laughs> I'll buy that. Um, you know, it's important to me really personally deeply important to be the best and that doesn't mean you can sit on your laurels so I'm always looking how can we do a better job for our guests a better job for our staff and yes. our community I went uh, three weeks ago to Rhode Island because they were having the first conference on prevention yes imagine. Nikon was having I mean it's amazing. amazing so little is done about prevention and it's the whole thing they're looking for new drugs you don't need new drugs. You just don't have to get, get sick, sick in the first place. Exactly. It's not required. That whole line of sick and old, it's a fabrication. Yes. You don't have to be sick when you're old. Yes. And you don't have to be old when you're old. It all is a state of mind. You don't need all these TV ads on drugs and all this stuff. Yes. It's just no, it's not necessary. No. You know, I seen one of these ads and I thought it was a skit from Saturday Night Live but it was a <laughs> real uh, commercial for an antidepressant a woman's on a, well, everybody on a blanket has to have and it. it's everybody a picnic has, and yeah. to be cheerful with her children she had to take a drug and I thought this is a skit from Saturday Night Live when people have goals and ideas and thoughts that are important to them yes when they know that they are contributing to the welfare of others. And when they find that role, then they won't have time to get sick. Yes. They won't have time for all the aches and pains because they'll be so busy being creative and enjoying life and having a good time that, that why bother with yeah. all that stuff? It's so interesting because some of our uh, more native um, groups all honor the wisdom of the elder yeah. and that's the person held in the most esteem because that is the one that teaches the next generation because they've had experiences of course they've been through it they know they know they I don't want to say right from wrong but they know the better yes and psychologically the healthiest senior is the one that invests back into the generation behind them. And that's so important, particularly since our country is soon going to have a majority of 60 plus. Is that, the, that these baby boomers of which <laughs> I'm one? <laughs> it's so important. Yes. The seniors are needed, they're required, they're not a burden, they need not be a burden. And our future depends upon mobilizing. And Their wisdom, energy. and wisdom. Margaret Mead said, you know, next to every nursery, every school should be a home for the aged yes. so that these elders could really help educate these young. I, have, I knew Margaret, and uh, yes, indeed, she really felt the importance of the wisdom yes. of the elders and mm -hmm. saw them as sources of wisdom. And they are. Yeah. If I said to you, what was the thing you loved the most that you did? Would it be what you're doing to help native cultures and bringing them into some, some semblance of understanding of who they are and how they fit in the world? I feel that through my experience that each segment of my life has been ever more important. Ah. That I have the opportunity, the knowledge, uh, the acceptance you know, it's a lot easier. Yes. People expect me to have crazy ideas and expect my crazy ideas to work. Um, but I feel that because we're a nation of immigrants and now a nation of new immigrants, you know, things are changing. Yes. And the immigrants not only bring energy and knowledge, uh, but they need to understand our energy and yes. knowledge. They don't know anything about the civil rights movement. Right. 
they don't know anything about the women movement. Yes, they need a context. And they need, yeah, because if they're reading about George Washington yes. to get their citizenship, it's not helping them to understand our country. Yes. So we have a very important educational role yes. so that they can take their responsibilities. Well, I always ask all of my guests a surprise question. I always ask, what was the defining moment in your life? I guess it's two. One, being raised in Tahiti, which gave me a different perspective. But most of all was my husband, because I wanted to be good enough for him. And so I read and I studied. I didn't go to college. Yes. And I, he was brilliant, and I wanted to be worthy. And so I think a lot of my drive goes way back to then. And uh, then when I achieved it, I have the kind of ego to want to be a perfectionist. So he really was your professor. Yeah, he was. And we've both known grief, and we've both had this, this touchstone of knowing that life is impermanent. And when you look at that and, and how it unfolds, how does it relate to the way you connect to others today in your compassion and your empathy? I just like people. Yeah. And so it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. Well, I like you. Thank you. And I loved having you. You've been a pleasure. Uh, honestly, I feel honored that you're sitting here. I thank you for coming, and we're going to do this again. Thank you. I'd love to. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah Sege, your life has been truly amazing, and your accomplishments are stunning. You're a model and a mentor for people everywhere. Thank you for sharing your journeys. I am Dr. Gail Gross. Thank you for watching. We are PBS.